It's Sunday morning, and we are in a study in the book of Revelation, and uh, we've spent quite a bit of time in this. In fact, I did a series six or seven years ago. It, it was a series that went on for four years on Revelation on Sunday night, and there was 236 uh, messages in that series. And what we've done, the way you study Revelation, is, or study any book for that matter, but particularly Revelation, you go into every, nearly every word in the book, every culture, every custom, every idiom, every metaphor, because at the first of this book, I've, I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. In the first, first uh, chapter, in verse 1, will tell you what the book is, is, is doing. In that first verse of Revelation, the first chapter, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Of course, this is the revelation of Jesus. Revelation is the word apocalypsis. A-P-O-K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S. What? Somebody say something? Okay, apocalypsis. And we get our word apocalypse from this. Now, most people think an apocalypse is something mysterious with a, a haze and a fog and something you can't quite understand. That's the exact opposite of Revelation. Revelation, apocalypsis comes from two words, apo and calypto. When, in fact, when you put apo and calypto together, they, these two words together, apo calypto, is the word revealed. When we reveal something, you take the cover off. Well, that's what this means. Abel means off with the cover. That's what you do. You take it off. It's not a secret anymore. It's not a mystery anymore. So it means to take the cover off. And John is saying here, I'm going to take the cover off, but I'm going to use pointers and signs. I want to give you culture of the day, idioms and metaphors, and cultural attitudes and what they believed. When you're studying the Bible, let me say this again. You need, some, you need to study Roman. Romans didn't have much culture. The Romans were very barbaric. They were killing the Christians by the hundreds of thousands. Uh, and then you could say later on by the millions. You had Roman history and you had Roman uh you had Roman law, Roman law, and the Romans, since they didn't have any, any culture to speak of, they had retained the Greek culture. And everyone in the world was called, that wasn't a Jew, was called a Greek or a Gentile. When Paul says there's neither Jew nor Greek, he's talking about people who are under the rule of the Roman Empire but Greek in the sense of culture. Because Alexander the Great ruled the world from around 330 B.C. until, well, actually about 332 B.C. until three, around 320. For about 12 years. And he gave the world all of its languages. Of course, the language had been 800 900 years in developing. The Greek language wasn't invented at this time. They were using it and it had been developing and the Grecian Empire had been developing over an 800 year period before. It, it's, it'd be a little system growing and it'd grow bigger and bigger and bigger and when it got so big it would try to overthrow the current empire and that's what happened when Alexander the Great overthrew the Persians. Well, he gave them the languages or the glossa and the dialectos are the dialects and that's the words that have been translated tongue we don't believe in Pentecostal tongue tongues because it's just not true they all spoke with heteroglossa as the spirit gave them utterance in Acts 2 and hetero means other and glossa means foreign languages hetero and dialectos they had a different dialect of the what they call the corne. Corne is the word common. They had a common street language in every city state, and those dialects would differ as much as Spanish and Italian during our day and time. But they were still the same language, it's just different dialects. 
And just because you can understand one dialect didn't mean you can understand another. And they said, how hear we ever man and our own dialect wherein we were born. They weren't hearing this gibberish that goes on in the Pentecostal churches. And I don't care if people, they think, if they hear me say that, it's gibberish. It's a bunch of foolishness. Because you have to literally throw away the definitions to come up with Pentecostal tongues. You have to throw away the culture, the customs, and the whole thing. And then, then they had all of these. Alexander the Great gave them their cultural idiomatic languages. He, they, their philosophies. Their philosophies were given by Alexander the Great. And over that time period, there were these great uh, philosophers like Aristotle and Plato and, of course, Socrates, because he's the one that's doing the talking in Plato's dialogues. And then you had uh, Plutarch, and then the list goes on and on. This goes on and on, and they had cultural sayings. They had cultural, they had philosophical sayings. Philosophical sayings. And your two most popular cultures in the first century, uh, does anybody remember what they were? Huh? What? Okay, thank you. <laughs> the Stoics and Epicureans. And Paul would use Stoic and Epicurean terminology. He would use their terminology. Whenever he would use the word belly, he would say, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses that are contrary to the doctrines that he have learned. Uh, and because these serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly. That was an Epicurean term. You're not going to know that Or when Paul would say to Titus. He said the Christians are always liars. They're slow bellies. That was an Epicurean term. And the Epicureans, when we think of an Epicurean, we think of someone who eats and a connoisseur of good foods. Well, the belly, they said, was the seat of all sensual desires and that's all the spiritual things you needed. That's all you needed. And the Stoics, they, they were probably the most popular of the philosophic groups and the stoics they had sayings it's like uh, when john the baptist was baptizing jesus on the jordan river in matthew the third chapter <coughs> pentecostals don't know this because they don't study they don't study stoicism and they don't study epicureans when john the baptist was baptizing he said i baptize with water but there comes one after me who will baptize you with holy spirit and fire well, spirit and fire, spirit and fire, that is the word pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. Spirit is the word pneuma. It means breath. And pneumonia is a breathing disorder or disease in our lungs. And fire is the word per, per. Well, pneuma and per was a stoic term and it actually meant life life uh, mr mr zeno who started started stoicism he said all the universe this was around 330 bc he said all the universe was a cosmos an orderly arrangement and that's the word world in john 316 it means an orderly arrangement we get our word cosmos our word c-o-s-m-o-s with the word cosmetic, we get it means to adorn. It means an orderly, orderly arrangement, orderly arrangement. And that was that was a stoic term. That was a stoic term. So they had idioms and metaphors just like we do. That's the point I'm getting at. So when John the Baptist said he'll baptize you with holy pneuma and purr, Holy Spirit and fire. Being a stoic term, that meant life. And, and, and Mr. Zeno said all the universe was a cosmos and what gave it life was pneuma and purr. That's what it, it, it's really not even hard if you know the culture. Now, 
that's something that I've never heard, heard a Baptist say. I've never heard a, I have never heard a preacher in my life say this in my life. But you can get this out of, uh, out of one of my books. It's called uh, Harvest of Hellenism by F.E. Peters. It's an excellent book. It's on the culture of the first century. It's a good book. It's an older book. You might have to find it on the internet. Now, the fact that John is saying here, he said this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now that we really understand that everything was a cultural meaning, then John goes on to say in that first verse of Revelation, the first chapter, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him, gave unto John, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent. This last sentence here will tell you how God is going to reveal Jesus throughout this book. And he sent and signified it by an angel unto his servant John. He signified semiao. That means that is the word, same word as S E M E I O N. This is a verb, this is the noun. When the Pharisees would come and say, Give us a sign. Well, a sign is a pointer. So these characters and these idiomatic language in the book of Revelation, they are pointers. But you have to go back and find out what does this pointer mean in the first century. You can't read Revelation and see, see locusts coming up out of, a, out of a pit and think that it's an actual pit and that it's actual smoke and these are actual locusts. That's not what it's talking about. You have to look at the culture of the day. Now, so it means pointers. It's the same thing I've said before. If you're riding down the street and you see uh, two golden arches here and you see a sign up here that says McDonald's, you can just see the golden arches and you know that means there's hamburgers for sale in this building down here. That that's those are signs. That is what these golden arches point to something that's cooking on that grill down there. They're pointers. They are semiao. Well, the Lord said, "What I'm going to do." It's the same thing that he that he said. He's given them a visual parable. It's a good way to put it. A visual parable. The in the 13th chapter of Matthew. The, the, the apostles came to Jesus and said, Why do you speak to us in parables? Parabole. Parabole. It comes from para and ballo. Ballo is our word ball. means to throw or cast or lie down beside. Para is our word parallel. It means to cast down near. It means... To give something that's right close to the real thing and it will point over to it and it runs parallel with it. And it's something that represents this over here. So what he's doing, he's giving us signs and pictures. But you have to go back to the first century in order to find out what these things mean. Now, let's go back over here. When, when, let me give you one other verse. When I'm teaching in the book of Revelation, I will tell people that in that first chapter, that 20th verse of the first chapter gives you a more or less an overall understanding of the book. First of all, you have to know what an angel is. When you see angels anywhere in the New Testament, the word is angelos, A-G-G-E-L-O-S. That's the word angel in the Greek. It merely means messenger. That's all it means. And it didn't matter what kind of an angel it was, it was a messenger. It could be a heavenly angel, it could be Michael or Gabriel, or it could be a preacher, or it could be you, or it could be just a secular angel, someone, or a secular messenger, you're going to take a message down the street to the lady that is a block away, and you were called an angel. It didn't mean you were, uh, that you were holy and cherubic and you weren't getting in trouble for your mother if you took a message down there, it just meant you were a messenger. If we can get this thing about angels, what we've preconceived in our mind, we think angels are female, don't we? That's what everybody makes them out to be. 
every time you find the word angel in the Greek, it's, it's masculine and gender. It's male. Masculine and gender. And any time you see little angels out here, over here at Cracker Barrel, and they got some out there, they're always females with these pretty little faces. Well, they were males. You wouldn't think that, that Michael's face was a pretty little face when he'd come out and kill 185,000 of the Assyrians in one night. He didn't look angelic to them at all. So these are messengers. Gabriel would do the announcing. He was the announcing angel. He went to Mary. He went to uh, the old prophets. He went to Daniel and talked to Daniel. And he would go and talk to these and do the announcing. And Michael, the archangel, would be, uh, would be the angel of death, the one that would go in and just slaughter people. And uh, Now, we always look at that last verse of the first chapter. But you have to see, you've got seven churches of Asia mentioned in verse 4, seven spirits in verse 4, and you've got the seven churches mentioned again in verse 11, and you've got the seven candlesticks with Christ standing in the midst of the candlesticks, and that's Jewish. The candlesticks, you'll find, was inside the temple. And then we see seven stars in the right hand of Jesus. And then he says... In verse 20, And the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are. These seven stars in the right hand of Christ are. the, And it says the angels. Well, if there's seven stars, then there's seven angels. So you can say these seven stars are these seven angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So, when you find the seven angels in chapters 2 and 3 are about the seven churches of Asia, and seven does not mean necessarily just the numerical number seven. Uh, it's the word, this word seven is the word Shabua in the Hebrew, S-H-A-B-U-A-H, and Shabbat, it comes from the word. That word is the word that used to means to take an oath or to, and it comes from Shabbat or Sheba, S H E B A, which is the word seven. And Shabbat means to take an oath. And the Lord tells us we have to add to our faith in Second Peter one and five. Add to your faith, add, and he names seven things. We have to add to our faith in order to mature and grow up. So all this is, is very symbolic language, very figurative language. Now, let's go back over here and look at one of these figures. Let's go back and look at what we've been looking at. We've been talking about the bottomless pit of chapter 20. And you've got the bottomless pit all through the book. I don't know if I'll get back to that today or not. But I want to talk about the scorpions. Now let's go over to chapter 9 and look at these scorpions again. Now the reason we know the bottomless pit is not a hole in the ground is by the definition of the word bottomless pit. We see, and the main reason we know that the bottomless pit is not a hole in the ground is because of what is coming out of the bottomless pit. What arises out of the bottomless pit is locusts like scorpions. That rises up out of the bottomless pit. Also, the beast, which is not a man, rises up out of the pit. And we keep saying that the beast in Revelation 13 is neuter gender. Therefore, all the hymns and the hisses that refer back to the beast should be its that the dragon gave it its power, its seat, and its great authority. And you can say, well, Jim, are you smarter than those translators? Yes, in that sense I am. Because in the interlinear Bible it says its. It has to follow when it says the beast. And the beast is neuter gender, and we know it has to be neuter. It has to be an it because it was an it over here in Daniel 7. It was the Babylonian lion, the Persian bear, the Grecian leopard, which is Alexander the Great, and the bear was the largest 
carnivore and the Persian armies had the largest armies and the lion is the most regal of animals and the Babylonian Empire was the most regal and majestic of all the empires. And then the Roman beast with iron teeth. Always the iron represents Rome. Iron teeth because it devoured all the others. Now, we see the scorpions coming up out of the pit and we see the beast, which is an it. It's the middle, it's the lion, bear, and leopard, and the beast with iron teeth. Now, we're looking at the scorpions. There's some things about the scorpions we hadn't talked about yet. And we know that the bottomless pit is the word abusos, A-B-U-S-S-O-S. It is a construction of the word bathos, B-A-T-H-O-S. And I don't care if you call it bathos. We're not here to pronounce the words exactly right. I'm just here so you'll find out what the words mean. And, uh, you, and bathos means something with great intellectual depth or knowledge. We've already gone through this. I'm not going to go through that again. If you're watching for the first time on this tape and you want the rest of those DVDs, they're, your, they're yours for free. We don't charge for them. And uh, if, all you have to do is call and ask for them. Well, when you place the alpha in front of a word as a negative particle, placing the alpha in front of bathos, it translates abusos, and it means a place of no, this negates the word, it means a place of no great knowledge or intellectual depth. It means a place of no knowledge. It reminds me of the word nice. Doesn't it you? Niskir? That's a French word. It's our word nice. It comes from ne and skir is our word science or knowledge. Knowledge. And when you're nice, you have no knowledge. When you act nice, when you act nice, you pretend you don't know what's going on and you're playing dumb. And that's what most of the preachers are doing in the world. They're acting nice and pretending they're so dumb they don't really know what's going on biblically. Well, we just don't believe that. We believe in loving everyone and, and we don't have any idea what the word love means, but we believe in loving them anyway. And they don't. And I'm not going to go into that. So the place of no knowledge is a bunch of nice guys, isn't it? Or they're acting nice. See, I don't believe preachers, I keep saying this. When you think a preacher's as nice as he, is, as he looks, you believe something about him. I don't believe. I believe he's smarter than that. I don't believe they're as stupid as they act. There's no way they can be that dumb. Billy Graham can't be as dumb as he acts. He can't be. He's 92 years old. You can't be that stupid. In that many years... He's never found Romans 8 and 29 for whom he did for no. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. He's never found when Rebekah had conceived by one, even by father Isaac, for their children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him that call us. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. You never, he's, he's never found that string of scriptures in Romans 9. You think he's that dumb? I don't believe that. See, I believe they're smarter than they're putting on. That's what makes me angry. A man acts dumb, and I know he's not. You've got to be, an, you've got to be a moron to walk around the world for 90 years and not see something going on. I'm just a nice guy, and I love everyone. Everything's wonderful. You believe that? You really have been conned, hadn't you? People are not that way, including Billy Graham and Charles Stanley and especially Kenneth Copeland and that bunch. They act dumb. Behind the scenes, I promise you, Kenneth Copeland cusses. Guarantee you he cusses. Well, I know that he does because this one guy used to come here said, this friend that he knew went motorcycle riding and one of them went down on a motorcycle one day and they got up just cussing the blue streak. Kenneth Cope and Jerry Savelle ride bikes together. And they're two of the big charismatic preachers. They didn't get up and say their Sunday school lesson after they fell on the bike, did they? 
Right. Now, it's hard enough for a true believer not to do these things, much less a man who's a false teacher and a liar. Now, just examine yourself. Do you do some things that you shouldn't be doing? Well, do you think that possibly Kenneth Copeland might? Certainly they do. Good night. I'm smart enough to know people are smarter than they act. Now, you can play dumb around me. But some of you will come to me and say, Now, Jim, or don't tell Jim that I'm the sinner I am. I know you are. <laughs> I've wrestled hard enough with mine. Now, let's get back over here to, back over here to the ninth chapter. Of Revelation. And the fifth angel, there's, there's seven angels here. Those same seven angels, they're given trumpets here in verse 2 of chapter 8. And this is all about Israel and the spiritual temple, which is us. And I'm not going to go into all that, but it's, I can sit, spend all day long doing that. And they have seven trumpets, and they begin to sound the trumpets, and the first trumpet sounds in verse 7, the second trumpet sounds in verse 8, the third trumpet sounds in verse 10, the fourth trumpet sounds in verse 12. In chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth angel sounded its trumpet, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. What is the star? Huh? What is the star? Does anybody remember? The seven stars in the right hand of Christ are the seven angels with the seven trumpets. Isn't that what it says? Look, let's be, let's pretend we're in the second grade, okay? <laughs> See, fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. And look at chapter 1 and verse 20. And the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels with the seven trumpets of the seven churches. So when you see the fifth angel sounded in chapter 9 verse 1, and I saw one of the stars in the right hand of Christ, which was a voice coming out of the trumpet. We've said in chapter 4 that trumpets were voices. In chapter 1 a trumpet was a voice. So these are, this is the refined church preaching out the truth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and there rose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke from the pit. And we've said, I don't know how to do it other than put it back on the board. Scorpion. Remember when we said signify? I mean, we, we were talking about idioms and metaphors. This was an idiomatic term. Just like we say snake in the grass. We don't mean a snake crawling around the grass. We mean, we mean a used car salesman, don't we? Or a, a con artist. Con man. That's what we mean. Well, that's what they meant when they said scorpion. This is the word. And I keep saying that you have a noun and you have a verb form of the noun in the Greek. And we have that in our language too, uh, to some degree. You have a verb form of the word scorpios. You have the word scorpizo. And this is one of those signa This is one of those pointers. You have locusts that are like scorpions. Locusts like scorpions. Locusts like scorpions, like this. Well, Jesus said, now wherever you can find the verb form of scorpion, which is scorpizo, you're going to find what a scorpion is. Well, the scorpions, Jesus said, the hireling, the man who works for money and preaches in a church for money, he cares not for the sheep. This is in the parable of the good shepherd in John 10. He allows the wolf to come in and scatter the flock. Scatter is the Greek word scorpizo. It's the verb form of scorpion. So wolves are false teachers and hirelings are men who work for money. And wolves scatter. So a wolf scatters. This is the action of a wolf. And a wolf is a false teacher according to Matthew 
the seventh chapter in Acts, the twentieth chapter. Paul said, "Grievous wolves will come in when I'm gone." And Jesus said, "You're going to know these, these, these false teachers. They're wolves in sheep's clothing." Then Matthew seven. So scatter. Scorpions are false teachers. In the word blind, what they do is they blind people. Blind people. The word blind is, that's one of the words for proud. Men who are scorpions, they're proud. Or if they're false teachers, according to the 6th chapter of 1 Timothy, they're proud. They know nothing. That's no knowledge, isn't it? Know nothing. Then in the 6th chapter of 1 Timothy, Paul's telling Timothy, Look out for these people that know nothing. They're proud. And that word proud is the word tufao. It means to be, it means to be blind. And it comes from the word tuflos, which is the word blind. And it means to be slowly consumed by smoke with no fire. And the word means to be conceited. When they said blind, they meant blowing smoke we perhaps get our word blowing smoke from that when somebody blows smoke what are you saying they, what do you mean they're big talking mega talk talking big telling you how great they are and how wonderful and all great things they're going to do they're just con men is what they are so that's the smoke it's the blinding of these and of course we know the locust anytime you see locust you think famine God tells Israel, he says, if you go after these other gods, when he, Moses is leaving Egypt after, after 40 years, after 400 years in Egypt, and he goes to Mount Sinai, and he gets this, this message from God, and God says, if you go after any other gods, when you go in and repossess the land of Israel, he said, I'm going to send some judgments, I'll send the sword against you, your enemy will come against you and you will flee every direction and, and I'll send famine and I'll send, he says this over and over and over. I don't even have time to read the times. He says he's going to send famine constantly. You can go through Jeremiah about 30 or 40 times. He says I'll send famine through the book of Jeremiah. He says it through Ezekiel. He says it through all the Old Testament couple of hundred times. I'll send famine when you go after other gods. Well, did Israel go after other gods? Well, they went after Baal, Grove, Grove, Shemash, Molech, and all these are sun and tree goddesses, and the sun god's birthday was December the 25th. And these are all the tree goddesses. Tree goddess, and that's the Christmas tree. It was a green tree. That's what the scripture says. So, God says, I'll send famine. And the way he sent famine, he would either have no rain, and he had no rain for three and a half years under Elijah. That in the 17th chapter of 1 Kings, Elijah says, there'll be no rain for three and a half years because you've built temples for Baal and the grove here in Israel. He tells Ahab that. And God strikes Israel with a three and a half year famine with no rain. And sometimes God would send locusts in by the hundreds of billions. Now, some writers say that the locusts, well, I got it over here somewhere. I got a locust. Oh, here it is. Some say they were two to three inches long. Some writers say they were up to six inches long or more. And they're just great big grasshoppers, and they traveled hundreds of miles in 24 hours and they devour everything in sight. They, this was one of the most terrifying things to Israel because it meant our food's going to be gone tomorrow and we don't have any idea what we're going to eat. They had to eat locusts. It's the only thing they could eat. Uh, they do fry grasshoppers and eat them, but that's not going to last them all winter. And they would just literally devour their crops. And God tells them constantly, I will send this famine, I'll send locusts, <laughs> And he says that and repeats that over and over. Well, they destroy the food crop. False teachers or scorpions, this is how they're alike. They blind the truth, and the locust would block the sky. Some say up to, it would be 20 miles, maybe, 
maybe 20 miles long, maybe 10 miles wide, thick, just a tr tremendous cloud of locusts, and it was so terrifying, you could see it from horizon to horizon, and they're coming. And it, they sounded like, some of the writers say they sounded like galloping horses. They say they look like horses. In fact, if you look at one of them from the side, they look kind of like a horse. And they sounded like crackling fire. Sometimes they said they would sound like horses' uh, hooves in the distance, just coming. Like, like just a magnificent, wondrous miracle of God to destroy the sin in Israel. Now, there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given the power, as scorpions of the earth have power. Well, when you don't have any food and they destroy your food, you get weak, you get dizzy, and you get to, you have problem uh, with your health. When scorpion stings you, you get. I did a series on scorpions one time, and I did a research on it. You get numb. That's what happens. The Bible says with the winds of doctrine over there in the, in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. When you listen to the winds of doctrine, you go on a blind search. You become transient. You wander here and there. You listen to all these preachers. And there's this great sound throughout the earth right now of scorpions. Tremendous buzzing sound. It's on the radio. It's on the TV. It's on... It's everywhere you turn. You've got preachers everywhere lying and not telling the truth, not talking about a daily cross, death to self, self-denial. There's no suffering for righteousness' sake. No, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. And when Paul said that, tribulation, Philippians does not mean being behind on your, on your car payment. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean being behind on your rent. When Paul said that, there in that, 14th chapter of Acts. He had been taken outside the city by the people of Lystra and they stoned him and left him for dead. And they stoned him so bad they'd pick up big 25 pound 15, 20, 25, 30 pound stones and th throw them down on a man after they threw him off of a cliff like he'd been in some severe car wreck. They, it looked, they, he was in bad shape. When Paul said we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God in Acts 14, 22, that was right after they had stoned him and left him for dead. When Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation, he's talking about people coming after you. You must be persecuted. And these preachers don't say this. They're scorpions and they're devouring the law of God. And law in the Greek is the word nomos. It means legal food for animals. And in our case, sheep. Legal food and the scorpions destroyed the food just like the locusts destroyed the food. And the locusts would block the light with that great big cloud of locusts. And the scorpions blocked the light. That's what they do. So the scorpions or the false teachers are like the locusts. When it says, out of the smoke comes locusts which are like scorpions. Now let's keep reading here. <clears throat> There came out of the smoke locust upon the earth. Unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Let me keep reminding you, these are signs. These are, when you see scorpion, it's pointing to a false teacher. And they're everywhere. I hear the buzzing, of the, the crackling of false teachers everywhere. People say, but they talk about Jesus and God. They don't tell you what anything means. They don't tell you about tribulation. They don't tell you about fire. And they got a whole bunch of false doctrine mixed in with it. That's the only way you can deceive is by mixing up a bunch of false doctrine, isn't it? And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. Unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth. What is he talking about? These locusts are going to be scorpions, false teachers. They're not going to go out in, upon the earth to destroy wheat crops. That's what he's saying. It's not going to be the literal crops that these locusts like scorpions. They're spiritual locusts destroying the food of God. So he's saying, they're not going to go out to destroy the grass of the earth or the wheat and the corn. 
even though that's going to go along with the famine, we have that famine in the world. But what he says, what I'm talking about here is not particularly the grass out here or the food crop. I'm talking about spiritual food. Neither any green thing. These locusts are not going to go out there and get your fields or your orchards. These are going to get your spiritual fruit of the Spirit. That's what they're going to do and destroy it. Neither any tree, but only those men. Notice he puts these locusts here destroy trees and grass. And these locusts are scorpions or false teachers. They're going to destroy men, aren't they? That's what he's saying. If you just stop and take a look at these things real close. It was commanded that you shouldn't hurt the grass or the green things, neither any tree, but only those men that have not the seal of God in their foreheads. We talked about the seal of God a few weeks ago over there in... And uh, in fact, we've got the seal all through here. I just don't, I don't have time to go through all of it. But the word seal is the word sphragis. means the sign or signature. Notice in signature we have sign, sign. Sphragis or sphragizo is the verb, S-P-H. R-A-G-I-Z-O is the verb. This is the verb. This is the noun here. And he says, only those that have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Well, to have a seal of God doesn't mean... Notice there's going to be a mark of the beast in the forehead, in the hand, and the seal of God is going to be in the forehead, in the hand. It doesn't mean a literal marking or a computer chip. To have something before the eyes there in Deuteronomy 6 meant to put it in the mind. To have it on the hand meant to whatever your hand found to do, do it with all your might, do it all to the glory of God. The Bible says God is not worshipped with men's hands. That in Acts the 17th chapter. He's not worshipped with men's hands. When you lift up holy hands to the Lord, you don't raise your hands in the air. That's men's hands. You lift up your hands to do the work of God. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, do it all to the glory of God, and do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the mark upon your hand. That's the authority the word mark, remember the word is karagma, means authority and it comes from the word, it comes from the word karaks, means a stake on a boundary line. And our boundary line is prohorizo. That's the word predestinate. It means to be forebound. And that horizo is our word H-O-R-I-Z-O-N, horizon. And that's the light. We have the light in our mind. We have the light upon our hand. Wherever we go and what we do, we have the light of God in our hand. Now, and he says here in the seventh chapter of Revelation, he speaks of those that have the mark upon their, upon their forehead. And 144, 12 times 12,000, 12 times 12, 144, that is the, in the 14th chapter of Revelation, that is the redeemed of the earth that follow the Lamb. Where he goes, that's you and I. We follow the Lamb. Being the first fruits, being a kind of first fruits, and James 1.18 says we are the first fruits. So if we're the first fruits, then we're the 144,000. That's all the believers. That is a figurative number for the believers. In fact, 12 is the number of the total church, 12 apostles, 12 uh, disciples, or 12 apostles, 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, 12 baskets full of bread and we being many are one bread and one body 12 baskets of bread and then the 6th chapter of John so that none would be lost and we're the bread now to them it was given that they should not kill them but that they should be tormented 5 months now 5 months is a very significant number the lifespan let me give you this the lifespan of a locust is from May through September. Five months. It's a five month period. What happens between May and September? Crops. 
crops. Isn't that true? Crops from May to September. The harvest begins April, May, ends up here in September. We call it the end of the harvest on October the 31st. But you're ending, this is the lifespan of the locusts, and it gives a five-month period. It's giving an idiomatic picture of, of the, that's similar to a locust. It's the time of the food period to destroy the crops. It's all it's saying. It's, very, it's fairly simple. Then he goes on to say, <clears throat> then he says, Huh? What verse? What? Oh, verse 5. Verse 5. <clears throat> if you go back and find the culture, you're going to find out what these things mean. Now, and to them it was given that they should not kill these men, but they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh the man. If you live out in West Texas or Arizona and you leave your shoes outside, you better check your shoes before you put them on. Scorpions crawl up into the dark. They'll crawl up in your shoe and you'll put your shoe on. If you're walking and you'll get stung. If you're walking out in the desert barefooted, you'll get stung. They wore sandals back then. And usually when you got stung by a scorpion, it was in the foot. And this word torment is the word bassanizo. B-A-S-A-N-I-Z-O. This word bassanizo, it means a touch stone. A touch stone is a stone that, that evaluates the genuineness of another stone. Uh, a touchstone would be like a diamond. A diamond will cut glass, another stone won't cut it. A diamond would be, would be a, glass would be a touchstone for a diamond to check to see if it's actually a diamond. Well, that's the word torment. And this word torment it's a derivative of the word basilius, which is the word rain, or basilica, which means kingdom, kingdom or king, king. And it also comes from the word basis, which means the foot, or the foundation, or the walk. So when, we are, when, a, when a person is stung, we're, t we're told to walk orderly, and when a man walks disorderly, he's been stung by a scorpion. But it's not supposed to hurt us because we're believers. We can't be continually led away by the false teachers. Let's continue reading here. When he striketh a man... And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And it reminds me of that first chapter of Philippians. Paul was going through all kinds. Paul was in a Philippian jail. He was extremely depressed. You say Paul went through depression? He said, I was pressed out of measure. I despaired of life. If you go through depression, you're supposed to. I've been going through a period of depression for about a month. I can't get out of it. And I told Mike coming to church, that doesn't have anything to do with what I'm going to do. I mean, I could just break down and start crying sometime. Because of a world that doesn't believe God, I get extremely depressed over it. Sometimes I don't know what to do. So I just keep doing what I'm doing. I want to go find a hole somewhere out in the middle of Arizona and crawl in it and not come out. You ever feel that way? Well, don't feel alone. You're not the Lone Ranger. 
I'm there with you half the time because I go out and preach to the world every week, every day sometime, and I can't find any Christians in Hendersonville that want the truth. God help us. And Paul says here in Philippians, he says, I want to die. If it wasn't for this church, I'd rather be out of here. But the church needs me here. If there was no place to preach, and I get too old to preach, I pray God will take me away. And the more you live in truth, the less you want this world. That's what he said here. Look here in, look here in verse 21 of chapter 1. This is what this is talking about. It's not some mysterious thing. I heard preachers say it's men wanting to die. They jump off buildings and they don't die. They just squash on the ground. They jump in front of a train and they, they don't kill him. He just mangles all in his arms over here and his body's over there and he, he doesn't die. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about what Paul's talking about right here in Philippians 1, verse 21. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. You're not going to feel that way till, you, till God deals with your heart to work continually in the work. And the more you work in the work, you realize there's nothing in the world to live for and you get depressed with it, but there's only one place to go and that's forward. There's nowhere else to go. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is what I get. This is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I know not. I don't know what to choose for. I am in a strait. I am perplexed. I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better than this world. I know what that feels like. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. That's why I'm here. I have uh, something to do, and so do you. That's what this is talking about. In those days shall men seek death, but shall not find it. Look at Job 3. Look at Job 3. It, this is not mysterious language. If you ever start living for God, completely living for the Lord, and do that year after year after year, you'll get depressed enough to want to leave this world. But you will say, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain, it's more needful for me to stay here for the church. People, God needs me to work here until he gets ready to take me out. Look here at the third chapter. Job was the richest man of the East. Had all these thousands of camels and asses and sheep. And God had, and Satan went before God and God told Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? How he's righteous, he eschews evil, and he's the richest man of the East. And Satan said, Well, there's no wonder he, he worships you. Look at all you've given him. You've built a hedge around him. Satan was a charismatic prosperity preacher. And God says, okay, I'm going to turn him over to your hand. You can take everything, but don't you touch his body. Do you hear me? He said, yes, sir. After he stripped Job of everything he had, Job put on sackcloth and ashes in that end of that first chapter and said, the Lord giveth and the Lord hath taken away. He didn't say God took, he didn't say Satan took away. He said God hath taken away. Satan is nothing but God's devil doing God's bidding. Right. That's what he is. In the last verses, in all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. Job tells the truth about me. I killed his kids and I took his camels and asses and sheep and all of his substance. In the next chapter, Job says, Satan comes before the Lord and says, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give to save his skin there in verse 4 of chapter 2. And he says, Let me touch his body with boils and blisters and deathly disease, and he'll curse you. God says, go ahead. And Job's wife comes to Job. This shows the sovereignty of God. 
She comes to him in verse 9 of chapter 2. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. She didn't say curse Satan, did she? She knew all this was of God. Job's wife knew that. And then here's Job's words while he is sick from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And Job says, And he said unto her, Woman, you speak like the foolish women speak. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil also from his hand? The evil comes from God. And then I love that next phrase, and all this did not Job sin with his lips. That's back to the Bible talking. The Bible says Job tells the truth when he talks about me. Job was depressed out of his mind. He wanted to die. But he wasn't going to curse God. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. After this opened Job his mouth and cursed his own day. And Job spake and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born, in the night in which it was said there is a man child conceived. Curse that day. Job was miserable in himself. There's nobody here has felt the pain more than Job felt. Let that day be darkness, and let not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon the day I was born. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Have you ever felt that way? Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. If we didn't feel this way, we wouldn't want to go to heaven, would we? You've got to be depressed to want to go to heaven. If you have all the things that this world has to offer, a brand new Mercedes, a, a $700,000 home on the lake, and, you got, and you're making 500000 a year, uh, why do you want to go to heaven? You don't, do you? As for that night that I was born... Let darkness cease upon it. Let it not be joined unto the days of the year. Let it not come in the number of the months. Lo, let that night be solitary. Let no joyful noise come therein. Let them curse the night I was born that curse the day who are ready to raise up the morning. Let the stars of the twilight thereof be dark. Let it look for light but have none. Neither let it see the dawning of the day because it shut not up the doors of my mother's womb. I wish those doors had been shut and I'd never been born, he says. Boy, he was miserable, wasn't he? Nor hid sorrow from my eyes. Why died I not from the womb? Why didn't I have a stillbirth? Why didn't I just die? All my seven sons and three daughters are dead. He's cursing his day. Don't even speak. Of but he said, though God slay me, yet will I serve him. I'll trust him. But I won't trust me. You cannot fully trust God until God disables you completely. When he'll disable you, then you can start trusting. You'll have to start trusting him because you know you can't trust yourself. Why did I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why did I die? I want to die. Job is seeking death, but death is fleeing from him, isn't it? This is talking about believers. It's going to get tough. Why did the knees prevent me? Why the breast that should suck? He's talking about the knees. That's where they came out between the knees. They had a stool that set up on. He said, why didn't they stop me? For now should I have lain still and been quiet. If I'd have died from my mother's womb, I would have been at rest. I should have slept, then I had been at rest. If I had never been born, I wouldn't be going through this. Or if I'd have been stillborn. So when he's talking, well, that's what this is talking about over here in Revelation. Men will seek death. And I've got all kinds of other verses on this. I'm not going to go through all of them. Let's continue reading. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. God calls the locust in the book of Joel. I call the book of Joel the book of the locusts. That's what the whole book is about. All three chapters of Joel is about the locusts. And the shapes of the locusts were like horses prepared into battle. 
on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. These are would-be kings. They placed themselves as kings, as rulers upon this earth. They're president of the Southern Baptist Convention, king. President of the Methodist Association. Heads of this, this ecclesiastical authority. They're false teachers. And what really amazes me, people, I've heard Hal Lindsey say they were helicopters, and I don't, have, no, I don't know how this next phrase can work with helicopters. And their faces, whereas the faces of men, they were men is what they were. I can't find any so-called scholars. I've got a book. It's a book on Revelation. It was written. I didn't know these things. I just happened to buy this book. It was reprinted. It was first printed in 1658, a book on Revelation by James Durham. I didn't know anybody else believed what I believed on this. And James Durham wrote this back in the 1600s. It shows you how far away we get from the truth, especially these last 150 years. And Hal Lindsey says they're helicopters coming out of a nuclear explosion in the ground. And John MacArthur says they're demons. They're false teachers. Well, the demon is self, so that would be true. They're only demons. They're not entities out here. They're you when you're teaching false doctrine. Let me read this verse 3, an exposition out of Mr. Durham's book on Revelation. There came out of the smoke, locust upon the earth, a vermin, as it were, engendered by the former corruptions, these as being special concernment in the anti-Christian kingdom are largely and particularly described. That these locusts were men, yea, that they were pretended church men. Thank you, Mr. Durham. I just, just, I read that and I wanted just to weep and cry. I thought, nobody else believes what I believe. I have to back up 300 years to find some man that believes what I understand about this. They're pretended church men. Promoters of errors and superstition. That's the truth, isn't it? Appeareth from this way that they stand in, in subordination to Antichrist and into a monarchic way are governed by Abaddon. We'll get to that in a minute. And must therefore be servants suitable to such a master and members conform to such a head. I love that where he says they're pretended churchmen. Oftentimes corruption of doctrine begetteth corrupt teachers to promote the same as we see in Jeroboam, 2 Chronicles eleven fourteen. And 15, 2 Timothy 4 and 3. The rejecting of sound doctrine, heaping up teachers after men's own lust are put together for a spirit of error, loveth to innovate in respect of officers as well as doctrine, and by it people are in some way deposed to strange teachers. They're deposed to go after strange teachers also for promoting new tenets. They're necessitated to make use of them. However, the scope in some prophecy is thus, that at the beginning of Antichrist's kingdom shall be by an eminent church officer, I've been saying that for a long time, who falling from the right exercise of ministerial authority is in subordination to Christ to be a promoter of the devil's designs and subservient to him. He says the same thing I'm saying. They're false teachers is what they are. They're liars. It's not just the Pope. It's the Baptist, it's the Pentecostals. Anybody who does not preach predestination and that God is totally sovereign, that they've got a little bit of light in them to bring themselves to Christ, that's false doctrine. People ask me, do you think that you have to believe in predestination to go to heaven? You can't deny it. You can't say, I hate that. I've had people, Baptists say, I hate that predestination. That means... If you're off on predestination, all the rest of your theology is off in left field. It's all askew. It's all twisted. Now, I don't know where to go from here. 
Let me go to the next verse and then I'll come back to some things. How much time do I have? And they had the hair as the hair of women. Hmm. And their teeth were like the teeth of lions. That's an old idiom out of the Old Testament. Look over in the Old Testament at Psalms 58. Psalms 58. Well, first let's go to let's go to Psalm 17. Psalm 17, a verse that I love. I've read this before, quoted it. Psalm 17. Now these false teachers have teeth of lions. Psalm 17. All right. Psalm 17. Verse 8. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Lord, protect me. This is David's prayer. From the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who compass me about. This is a good thing to read when you feel like you're just sinking at, at the hands of evil man and you're going through the straight gate, the stenos gate, and you're crowded on every side and you feel the pressure of the world. They are enclosed in their own fat. It doesn't mean they got a lot of cellulite. The fat to the Jew meant the richest of everything, the richest corn, the richest cattle. They're enclosed in all that their heart wants. That's another idiom. With their mouth they speak proudly. It sounds like false teachers, doesn't it? They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes bowing down to the earth like as a lion that is greedy of his prey. And as it were, a young lion. Young lions are extremely vicious. When they're hungry, they'll try to take on everything. Like a young lion. Well, the false teachers have teeth like lions. These scorpions, don't they? Lurking in the secret places. Oh, arise, O oh Lord. Disappoint these young lions. I had a movie out years ago, Marlon Brando and one of the old actors out of the, called The Young Lions. It was about some Germans that were fighters and the young, tough fighters. Young lion was an old term that meant a young fighting man. And they got teeth like lions. Arise, O God, disappoint him. Cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. These young lions are swords you're using to cut me down. From men that are thy hand, O Lord. From men of the world which have their portion in this life, whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. They're full of children. They have everything they want, all the kids they want. They leave the rest of the substance to their babes. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I wake with thy likeness. And let's look over here in Psalms 58. They have lion's teeth, don't they? Psalms 58. You see, you're going to get your answers out of the Old Testament. Let's read a little bit of this psalm. Let's read a little bit. So we can see these young lions with teeth. Do you indeed speak righteous, O congregation? Do you judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? Yea, in heart ye work wickedness. Ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They're like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear. These are false teachers. Which will not hearken to the voice of charmers. Charming never so wisely. Break their teeth. O oh God, in their mouth, break out the teeth of the young lions. That's not very Christian to say something like that, is it? Break their teeth, God. You shouldn't talk about these people, Jim Brown. God, I pray you'll break their teeth. They're trying to devour me. Deliver me, Lord. 
Break their teeth of the young lions, O Lord. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. That's not very nice, is it? Cut down the young lions with sharp teeth. That's what the scorpions have. They have teeth like lions because they'd devour us if they could. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away like the untimely birth of a woman, one who's stillborn, that they may not see the sun before your pots can fill the thorns. He shall take them away as a whirlwind, both living in his wrath. They would use thorns to light fires with. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance of God upon these young lions. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. You mean God wants to do this to wicked people? Yes, and he will. So that a man shall say, Verily there is a reward for the righteous. Verily he is a God that judges in the earth. Now let's go back over to Revelation. Read that verse again. And they had hair as the hair of women. I'll get to that in a minute. And their teeth were as the teeth of young lions. There's no doubt what a young lion was in the Old Testament. That was an evil man that was trying to devour the people of God, and that's what false teachers are. They're scorpions trying to devour the people of God. It's not talking about machine guns and a helicopter. That's dumb. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings of these locusts was as the sound of chariots of many horses running into battle. And that's what the locusts sounded like. They said you could hear them from six miles away when there were hundreds of billions of them, 20 miles long, 10 miles wide, maybe two or three, four miles thick. And they would just... <laughs> and God, and that scared them as bad as any army. Let me back up here. They had the hair of women. Let's go over to 11 chapter of 1 Corinthians. The women back in that day, the Jewish women and some of the other women, 1 Corinthians 11, they wore their hair in, a, in an adorned fashion. 1 Corinthians 11. They had a particular cut to their hair. And that cut was called an adorned cut. And the reason they cut it that way was so they could tie their dowry in their hair. The Jews said that if they found a woman in their halakha, if they found a woman that was better looking than their wife and saw her coming into town, they could find any excuse to divorce their wife. They'd walk in and say, I found a better looking woman, you get out and turn her out in the street. And the only thing she could carry with her, if she, if she burnt the bread or burnt the meal, or if she got a little giddy out in public and danced around and she's young, full of life and vibrant, and her husband would say, you're acting silly, I divorce you, get out. And the Pharisee said that's all he had to say. If she left, the only thing she could carry with her was what was in her dowry and she tied most of her dowry in her hair. That was the hair of women. She couldn't trust her head. And who was her head according to this 11th chapter? Let's look at it. We can trust our head. False teachers cannot trust their head which is supposed to be Christ. So they trust themselves. They're like women. They wear their dowry in their hair they had I have hair they trust themselves that's the point they're not their trust is not in God and here in chapter 11 be ye followers of me chapter verse 1 even as I am of Christ and that word follower followers me made taste means to mimic. 
He says, Be ye imitators of me, even as I am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. Let me write this on the board. We're talking about having the hair like women. Let me erase this. All right. Head of man is Christ. I'm putting this on the board so we'll make it very elementary, okay? The head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man. Head, this is the way God has the family set up. Head of woman is man. All right. Now this is a definition here. This tells you what the head of the man is and what the head of the woman is. And the head loves the body. Takes care of the body. Husbands, love your wives as your own body because you're the head and this is the, she's the body. You don't stump your finger and stump your finger and grab the other hand and say, I'll teach that finger to do that and get a hammer and hit it, do you? I'll teach you, don't ever do that again. Bang, bang, bang. All you're doing is hurting this, aren't you? Now, the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Head of Christ, Christ is God. It amazes me when people get into the rest of this chapter, they just forget this definition here. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. If he has, if man has what covered? Has his head covered? If he's covering up Christ, he dishonored. If he is not leaving Christ uncovered and allowing Christ to be seen in his life and he covers up Christ, he dishonors his head. Then all of a sudden, people preaching this go nuts. They just get crazy on the next verse. Every woman prayeth and prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, and say, oh, got to get something put on a woman's head. Isn't that it? Wait a minute. What is her head? What is her head? If she, when she prays, she needs to cancel out her husband and go to her husband's head. Doesn't she? That's what he's talking about. He amazes me. I've heard preachers preach on this. Women need to have their head covered in the church. Yeah, I know they do, but it's ridiculous because it's talking about covering. If she prays and lets her husband be seen in her prayer and he is influencing her prayers instead of Christ and the Father and we pray, we pray our Father which art in heaven, don't we? And Jesus is doing the will of the Father and we uncover Christ. We go to the, the wife is the church. Is the church, isn't it? And we, if you're praying and you're a woman, you have to cover up your husband and not be influenced by him and be impartial. You don't follow your husband when it comes to prayer. You follow Christ in prayer, don't you? You cover up your husband. That's what it's saying here. And the woman couldn't trust her head. We can trust our head, man, because our head is Christ. A woman can't trust her head. If the Pharisees come in and said, I divorce you, get out, she had to leave, and all she could carry was her dowry upon her head. That's all. And down here in, look down here in, uh, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. I've done series on it. I've got too much more to say. All right, look at verse 14. Doth not nature itself teach you 
that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Every Jew wore his hair long. Every Jew. Now, long hair here, long hair. In the English text, long hair, long tells what kind of hair, doesn't it? What kind of? That means long is an adjective. Adjective. Adjectives modify nouns and pronouns. It modifies hair. It puts a condition on the hair. It modifies it. And it modifies nouns and pronouns, and it tells which, what kind of, or how many. This tells what kind of hair in the English. That's not what it says in the Greek. Now, people say the King James Bible is the inerrant word of God. No, it's not. The Textus Receptus is the inerrant word of God. When you look at the Greek text on the top line, even the English under the Greek, I don't trust that. Don't trust English at all. I'm trying to explain in English, since we all speak English, what the Bible is talking about. In the text, it says, Does not nature itself teach you that it's shame if a man have komeo? Komeo. We get the word cameo. Komeo hair. This is a verb in the Greek. Can you translate a verb into an adjective? Can you do that? Is that okay, teacher? Huh? It's not okay to do that, is it? That's absolutely incorrect. It would have to actually have to say, does not nature itself teach you that it's a shame if a man long his hair? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Long his hair. It actually means to adorn. Is the derivative of the word cosmos or cosmetic. And cosmos means orderly arrangement and cosmetic when you say I got to go and put on my face <coughs> put my cosmetics on so it's a shame for man not to trust his head to have his hair adorned because he can't trust his head we can trust our head man but our wives can't trust their head spiritually in the long run she has to bypass us and go to our head doesn't she and if, if he said, if the, uh, let's go back over here. So when he says, they have hair like women. Oh, there's another verse here i got to give you. Hold on a second here. Uh, we're in the ninth chapter. Let me take you over here to, uh, so it's a shame if a man have long hair. Look at Luke 15. Go to Luke 15. Luke 15. And these false teachers don't trust God who's supposed to be their head since they're false teachers. They trust themselves. To adorn your hair meant you had no trust in anybody but you. The woman couldn't trust her husband so she carried her dowry in her hair. Where did I say I was going? Luke 15. Luke 15. If you'd read the other parts of the Bible, you'd find out and read some commentaries and you'd find out what these things mean. Now, it's, it's generally understood there's a woman here and she is... She loses a piece of silver... And every commentary I've ever read said it's pretty well established that it was probably her dowry in her hair is why she was so desperate when she lost it. In verse 8, he's talking about, well, let's read down to it. How much time do I have? 
let's read down to it from verse 3. And he spake this parable unto them. What man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, Likewise, Likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Either or else, or another way to express this, what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle? It doesn't mean candle. It meant a taper. It was a bowl. The reason they translated candle was during the King James Day the candle had become a standard of lighting houses and lighting the streets and putting them on those little glass enclosures you know, out in the streets. And seek diligently to find it, and when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And most scholars say it is... It is in all probability this was a part of her dowry that she had in her hair. And they were so afraid to lose any part of their dowry. And the only thing they could leave the house with was what they had on their person. That's the adornment of the woman. So when we're talking about scorpions or false teachers, they don't trust in the head, which is God, which is Christ. They trust themselves. And they have hair like women. Do you see? Mm -hmm. Now... Let's go back over here to Revelation. Gosh, I've got so much on this. Nine. Chapter 9. And they had breastplates, verse 9, had breastplates of iron, and the sound of the wings was as the sound of chariots, of many horses running into battle. Let me give you what one of my commentaries says on this, and this is out of the book of Joel. I meant to go back to the book of Joel and cover the whole book today, but I, Joel is the book of locusts. That's what it is. And God calls the locusts in the book of Joel, my army. That's a good way to destroy a nation, destroy this food supply, and they'll die shortly. It'll be a long death, in fact, it'll be a long, wearisome death. It'll be a horrible death. It'll be worse than just running them through with a sword. God says, I'll torture you with no food. The appearance of them as the appearance of horses. They are said to resemble horses in the shape of a head. Hence, the Germans call them, I can tell me what this is, hep for day, or hay horses, and the Italians, cavalette, this this resemblance had been noticed long ago by Theodoret, who says if anyone should examine accurately the head of the locust, he will find it exceedingly like that of a horse, and as horsemen, so shall they run in rapidity of motion. They resemble running horses like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. This is the next circumstance noticed about them. The noise of their motion, their motion was peculiar it was springing or leaping and when they sprang or leaped the noise they made resembled the rattling of jerky two-wheeled war chariots over a rough mountain road something isn't it? let me read what one of my other commentaries says the appearance of horses as horsemen. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. Their carriage for fierceness, agility, and irresistibleness is like that of horses trained up to the wars of which Job, Job 39, 19, and as horsemen so shall they run. This gives light to the former expression. And whenever the scripture will speak over in the Old Testament that we're not to put our trust in horses, that had the idea the horsemen chariots, that was armies in war. We don't put our, our faith in the flesh or some army to save us. It'll only be God that does that. And by it, we see these locusts are not resembled to the horse for shape, 
but for their nimbleness and motion. And as for these types, so should the armies which were typified be also. Like the noise of chariots upon the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of the flame of fire that divideth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Like the noise of chariots, such warlike chariots on resounding mountains do with their rapid motions, shaking their irons about them, make a great and dreadful noise. So should these locusts in their flight, by which they will terrify the people before they came to them, for the noise of them may be heard as much as six miles distance. You've heard me say that. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth its stubble, which does, which with continued crackling burn that, burn what is under the flame and threaten speedy and inevitable ruin to what is before it. All shall be endangered by it as if surrounded by flaming fire. That's what it sounded like. That's what it looked like. That's what these locusts were like. And remember, remember, when Nebuchadnezzar came from the east, here's what we call Iraq, and here's Israel over here, and they were Gentiles coming in from the east to take Israel into captivity, and the word Gentile is the word goyim, that's plural, goy singular, and it means a flight of locusts. It's amazing, isn't it? Now, I am running out of time. Do I have any more time? I'll just give you the beginning of the book of Joel and we'll stop. Just the beginning of it. Joel is the book on locusts. It's about God's... Joel lived around 800 B.C. And Joel was a contemporary of Isaiah and Amos. And he was prophesying the judgment of God that he was going to bring upon Israel. And he says here in this first chapter, verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, hear this, hear this ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land of Israel. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, their children, and their children another generation. That's which the palmer worm hath left. When I get through sending in the palmer worm, and that word palmer worm means a bristling locust. They just translated it palmer worm. It means a bristling locust hath left, the locust hath eaten, and that which the locust hath left, God says, I'm going to send in one right after the other to take your crops away when you go after Baal in the grove. The same system was brought in the church and renamed Christ's mass. I'm going to take your crops away. People say, what's wrong with Christmas? Ask Joel. And Pentecostals will read this and I'm going to give you back what the palmer worm's eating. Ha, ah, yes, you're going to prosper and have everything you want in life. And hath left the canker worm, hath eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar, caterpillar eaten. Oh, ye drunkards, spiritual drunkenness. I'm not talking about literal drunkenness. And weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth, for a nation has come up on you in my land, Babylon, Assyria, strong and without number, whose teeth are as the teeth of a lion. Babylon's coming. And he hath cheek teeth of a great lion. I'm out of time, but he goes on down into that next chapter, verse 11. He talks about these locusts coming in and jumping up on the walls of the houses and covering the land how the, their darkness comes and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. He says, these locusts are my great army. He equates the Babylonians, which are Gentiles, a flight of locusts with the literal locusts that are coming in. And he says in verse 25 of chapter 2, I will restore you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, but that's not going to come until repentance comes in the church. You can't be preaching false doctrine, charismatic doctrine, and get a restoration of anything. It's talking about spiritual restoration of God. 
God says, I'm going to destroy Israel for this. There's so much to this, I hope you understand. You get your answers in Revelation out of the Old Testament, some out of the New. Just go look up young lions and their teeth, and you'll find out it's those false teachers coming in. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. Help us to continue this message. Lord, I pray for the sheep. I know if I get down at times, they get down. Because there's no temptation taken to one of us, but such as is common to all of us. Help us all through all this. Strengthen the sheep. Lord, I, I need your help. Give me strength. Sometimes I, I don't feel like I can keep going. But I know I will. I pray for the sheep that you'll strengthen them. For those that are watching, strengthen them, Lord. Those in New York and out in Arizona and around the country that are watching, we pray for them, Lord. Crush us under your hand, as you will do, and lead us to your elect and open up doors for the ministry. And Lord, I will be here regardless to preach as long as you give me health. In Jesus' name we pray, man. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>